Good morning, everyone. This is Professor Muhammad Fargal. In this lecture, I'll talk about text types. The term text type has become a buzzword in linguistics these days. So in this lecture, I'll be exploring the most familiar text typologies, text classifications, to see what we mean by text type and the other term text genera, which is often used interchangeably with text type. First, I'll be looking at, so in this lecture, I'll be looking at mainly at three text typologies. Spoken versus written versus electronic discourse. This trichotomy, traditionally it was a dichotomy, but nowadays it is a trichotomy rather than a dichotomy. Then I'll talk about uh, familiar text typology, which is found in the literature, which can be integrated into four types of discourse, informative versus argumentative versus expressive versus instructive discourse. And finally, I'll be looking at everyday language versus literary language, which is also a familiar dichotomy, especially in academic circles. We see how literary language is different from everyday language. So let's start with the first typology, spoken versus written versus electronic discourse. First, let me talk about spoken versus written discourse, which is probably the most familiar traditional typology when it comes to text types. All literate people are, are aware of the fact that we have spoken discourse and written discourse. Even illiterate people are aware of that, despite the fact that they can only perform at the level of spoken discourse. But they know that there is written discourse. So how, how is spoken discourse, how is it different from written discourse? We can distinguish between them generally by talking about general attributes, which they differ in. The first attribute has to do with involvement, how much involvement there is in the communication. Involvement, involvement is the counterpart of detachment. And we can see that spoken language is highly involved, whereas written discourse is highly detached. Why is that? Because in spoken discourse, we are dealing with people in face-to-face -face interaction. Whereas in written discourse, we are only dealing with words on paper, texts on paper. So spoken discourse is highly interactive. It's interactive. Why? Highly involved. Why is that? simply because we have access to nonverbal communication. We can get immediate feedback. We can use all components of nonverbal communication, gestures, eyeing, facial expressions. So, so nonverbal communication makes spoken discourse highly involved. Not that nonverbal communication is not available when it comes to 
the written mode of communication, written discourse. You cannot get a few, uh, an immediate feedback, can you? For example, can you call the author to ask him about something? All right, this is very unlikely. Why? Because you're dealing with words on paper. You either understand what you read or probably ask someone, but later on, but not on the spot, the way it is done in spoken discourse. So here is a key difference between spoken discourse and written discourse. The fact that spoken discourse is highly involved, highly interactive, whereas written discourse is rather detached simply because nonverbal communication is absent in the spoken mood, whereas it is all there in it's absent in the written mode, sorry, while it's all there in the spoken mode. A second key general difference between spoken communication and written communication is the fact that spoken communication is fragmented in nature, whereas written communication is highly integrated. So here we have fragmentation versus integration. Fragmentation as a key quality of spoken discourse has to do with the fact that in spoken discourse, we repeat, we abandon sentences halfway, we backtrack, we pause the way I'm doing in this lecture, for example. Sometimes I say something, then I realize that I'm not saying the right thing or I should say it differently, so I backtrack and Correct, correct things. So it's, you know, spoken discourse is characterized by such things, by poses, for example. You pose when you are at loss with words, you pose in order to find a suitable word. If you realize that you're not doing something the right thing, then you may abandon the sentence halfway and go back and remedy things. So, but is this possible in written discourse? And the answer is no, it's not possible in written discourse. In written discourse, you have to produce integrated texts. You can't abandon a sentence halfway, for example, in a written discourse. You have to finish your sentences. And we, we, we don't know whether you backtrack or not, whether you abandon or not, because we have the finished product, which is highly integrated. You might pose a lot while writing, and sometimes we do. Some people may all right, pose for a long time before producing a couple of sentences, or they may abandon this job altogether and go do something else, then come back, and this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you'll have to have some product, finished product. And this product, is highly integrated. Notice that these general characteristics of spoken and written discourse are reflected in the kind of syntax and vocabulary we use. So the syntax of spoken discourse is different from the syntax of written discourse. Why? Because in written discourse, we opt for long sentences, we opt for subordination rather than coordination in order to organize our ideas and to bring out the interrelations between ideas by subordinating one idea to another and this kind of stuff. But in spoken discourse, we often opt for coordination using things like but, or, either, or, neither, nor, things like that, and, okay, these coordinators are so common in spoken discourse. In written discourse, we opt for subordinators like, despite the fact that, nevertheless, by contrast, all right, these things, you know, these things are 
often used in written discourse, but they rarely occur in spoken, however, for example. How often do we use however in spoken discourse? Okay, only in formal situations, but in the course of conversation, we rarely use things like, despite the fact that, however, nevertheless, rather we use, okay, the, the conjunction, but, and, or, okay. And this, this is reflected in the length of our sentences. The sentences we produce in spoken discourse are rather short characterized by coordination. And, but in spoken discourse, we can produce long sentences. The sentences are rather long. The vocabulary of spoken discourse is different from the vocabulary of written discourse. In written discourse, we use lots of Latin kind of words, words borrowed from Latin and French. But in spoken discourse, we rarely use such words. We use simple, and to sanction words, originally English words. Where are you going? Rather than what's your destination? Would you ask someone, what's your destination? For example, if you take a taxi cab, would the taxi driver ask you, what's your destination? Or where are you going? All right, it's just this, this has to do, but if you look at the sign there, posted in, in the car, then the word destination might be there, all right? So, so the sign would not say, where are you going? But rather, please indicate your destination. Again, how much do you, does this cost rather than, or how much is it from here to the city center, for example, rather than what's the fear? Or how much does it cost? Or just, it, okay, the vocabulary we use in spoken discourse is rather simple and informal. All right, the most frequent words. But in written discourse, we are right, some some writers opt to choose the most, you know, the most unused words in order to show that they are highly educated. For example, there are peruse instead of read. Deposit instead of drop. Will you please deposit this in the waste basket? Uh, deposit. Would you, this is bookish. Okay, one will say, will you, will you please drop it in the waste basket rather than deposit it, deposit it in the waste basket. Okay, why? Because deposit is, to deposit something is very formal. Whereas to drop something somewhere is informal. Get, I'm gonna get some cigarettes. W would you say I'm gonna obtain uh, some cigarettes? Ah, this is, okay, too formal. So the vocabulary is different, the syntax is different. The general nature of the communication is different. Nowadays, these two modes of discourse or these two text type, spoken discourse and written discourse, are mediated by electronic discourse, or what some people call it, net speak. Notice that this discourse, electronic discourse, is located halfway between them. So it is more interactive than written discourse, but less interactive than spoken discourse. Why? Because it's not face-to-face -face communication. It's more, in, uh, more interactive than communicating by Skyping, for example, or by chatting. But it's definitely more interactive than communicating by written articles. 
So spoken discourse here mediates between the two and has characteristics of both of spoken communication and written communication. And again, this kind of discourse comes in two forms. We have synchronic electronic discourse, chatting and Skyping, for example, and we have asynchronic electronic discourse, emailing and Facebooking. Okay. To communicate by Facebook or to, to communicate by email. All right, this is done, it's not done on simultaneously. That's why it's described as asynchronic or not synchronic. Whereas Skyping and chatting in chat rooms, or right, the communication is done simultaneously. That's why it's described as synchronic. So in present day discourse, the dichotomy, the traditional dichotomy of spoken versus written discourse has become a trichotomy. Spoken discourse versus electronic discourse versus written discourse. And as I have said, electronic discourse is much more interactive than written discourse, but it is less interactive than spoken discourse. In electronic discourse, you can use, for example, emote icons. Also, the language of the syntax is simplified. Vocabulary, lol, for example, and the new generation are so aware of such things used in chatting, for example. Low. Okay, just okay. Pr probably this has to do with age groups. Okay, when it comes to uh, okay the language used in this speak, both in terms of vocabulary and in terms of syntax. Okay, and there have been some recent studies about this, and, and we indicate that. There are changes happening. Okay, the next text typology, which is found in the literature, but not in the way I'm going to present it. Okay, I'll integrate what's in the literature into a four member typology which is very reflective of human communication, especially written communication, as well as spoken communication, of course, but may be reflected more in written communication. We have informative discourse versus argumentative discourse versus expressive discourse versus instructive discourse. Notice that these four types of discourse differ in their focus. The focus is different. That's why there are different types of discourse. They don't exclude each other. They don't exclude each other. So it's not a matter of X excluding or being exclusive of Y, but rather it's a matter of X having the focus that is not the focus of Y. So they differ in their focus. For example, informative discourse versus argumentative discourse. The focus on passing information is found in informative discourse. So an in informative discourse is a matter of passing information onto others. So the that is the focus of informative discourse. That's why it's called informative discourse. So not that this is an umbrella kind of type. And under this type of discourse, we have many genres. So here the term genre and the term text type. 
the term text type is more general than the term genre. A genre is found within a text type. It's true that many people use these interchangeably, but one has to be sensitive to this kind of distinction. Informative discourse. Under informative discourse, for example, we have news reports. We have analysis, analysis, reporting, description, narrating. When you tell a story about, all right, so something happened to you somewhere and you relay what happened to you to someone, all right, so you narrate what happened to you. Oh, oh. Notice that all of these belong to informative discourse. A news report, what do you find in a news report? You find information, but, all right. Can we claim that it's 100% information? All right, you might find some highly emotive adjective, for example, assuming that there is a report on an earthquake in Bangladesh. Okay, so the report here would relay what happened in terms of destruction, casualties, things like that. But in addition to that, the, the right, the, okay, the author might use some emotive ad, adjective, adjective, disasters. Okay, the, the, an adjective like disasters, terrible consequences, things like that would inject the discourse with some expressiveness. And, but at the end of the day, it stays as informative discourse. So the focus is on information, passing information in, in, into others. If the manager gives a report at the end of, the manager of the company gives a report at the end of the year. All right, this, all right, this is a genre of informative discourse. All right, the focus is on giving information about what has happened during a whole year. But it, he might try to justify some pieces of, of information in his report. And this would what? Would enter into the, the realm of argumentative discourse. But does it belong to argumentative discourse? And the answer is no, it does not. It is informative discourse that may have a dose of argumentative discourse. But it's, the focus is on information rather than on persuasion. If we look at the second type of discourse here, argumentative discourse, we type, okay, we find a completely different focus. The focus here is on persuasion, persuading the reader. So you have to manipulate things in order to get your message across and hopefully convince the reader of, or the hero or whatever you're putting forward. So the focus there in an in informative discourse is, is on information, but in argumentative discourse, the focus is on persuasion. And here you can contrast, for example, a news report and an editorial, a, a newspaper editorial. Okay, which is a general feature of newspapers, it's usually written by the editor in chief. But he's not there to inform you of something, but rather he is there to make you realize that something is happening and he wants you to 
see what's happening from his own perspective. So a newspaper editorial is argumentative rather than informative. But there must be some information there, right? So you cannot empty it of information. So, but the focus there is not to inform, but rather to manipulate ideas and to convince readers rather than to inform them. And under this text type, we have many genres. Okay, newspaper editorials, commentaries in general, are argumentative, debating as a genre of argumentative discourse. Presentations are supposed to be argumentative, especially professional ones. Political speeches. Why do politicians give speeches? To inform, to manipulate people. To convince them of a bunch of lies, nothing beyond that. And okay, it all depends on, on how educated the people are. The Arab masses are so gullible. They believe their readers. Well, they tell them it's just a bunch of lies, I think. Because if you look what's happening on the ground, it runs counter to whatever they say. This is what we call argumentative discourse. So argumentative discourse and informative discourse differ in focus. Informative discourse is there to inform, whereas argumentative discourse, discourse is there to persuade rather than to inform. And they both contrast with expressive discourse. Expressive discourse is there to impress the reader. So it has to do with what? With expressing individual feelings, the writer's feelings about something. And this is done in a creative way. That's why it's meant, it's meant to impress readers. And this involve, basically involves literature. All types of literature come under expressive discourse. Joking. Do you joke to inform? For example, in a joking session, okay, friends may come around and they start cracking jokes. Are the jokes meant to inform or to persuade? No, not at all. The focus is to generate laughter. So it's, it's a matter of what? Becoming better or closer friends. Adverts can be expressive. But I'm sure no expressiveness is not their main feature. Why? Because the focus of the adverb is to what? To persuade people to buy the commodity or to buy the service. So it can be both, both expressive and argumentative. What about information? There must be a dose of information, but again, most adverse involve what supplies, okay? They, for example, they tell you that a shampoo can do miracles when it does nothing. Okay, so this is basically false information, but at the end of the day, people are convinced, especially if the advert or if the commercial is given by a, okay, a very beautiful model. Okay, lying on her bed, scantily dressed. 
and talking about to, talking to her friend about a shampoo or some or something. All right, this okay, this kind of general advertising adverts, you know, are both argumentative and expressive. Says it really is really a matter of the producer. The producer can make it more argumentative or more expressive. Usually, flat adverts are not that attractive. So if they, all right, if they don't fare well in expressiveness, then, all right, they will. Okay, people might not be attracted to them. So an advert is supposed to be both argumentative and expressive. When it comes to literature, okay, as a genre of expressive discourse, there are many subgenres. We have different literary genres. Essays, poetry, fiction, drama. Okay, all these are genres of literary discourse. And all this stuff belongs to expressive discourse. So why would uh, someone write a poem? To inform? There must be some information there, but it's not, the focus is not to inform. To persuade? Again, persuasion would not be the focus. The focus would be on individual feelings. In other words, the objective is to impress rather than to inform or persuade. And usually poetry that is meant to persuade is not highly appreciated. Okay, so one has to go off the record when it comes to literature to be indirect rather than direct. So directness here is frowned upon in poetry, for example. And the last member of this text typology is instructive discourse. And the term is self-explanatory, all right? It's instructive discourse is there to instruct, to give a set of instructions. Not that instructive discourse can be optional or not optional, obligatory. Optional when you can either follow the instructions or just ignore them. For example, when you buy a fridge, the fridge comes with, with a manual. Do you have to read the manual before you operate the fridge? You may, but it's not necessary. So this is, okay, this is optional. So it is instructive discourse with option. With option means it's up to you to either read the manual or just drop it in the wastebasket and try start fiddling with your fridge to operate it. The same applies to e exams, for example. When you have rubrics. Some students ignore rubrics and go directly to answering questions. Some discourses, some instructive generals are without option. Means you have to follow the instructions. For example, treaties between countries. Muahadat. They are binding, okay? If the treaty is violated, then war might break out. 
contracts are also binding. When you sign a contract, you, all right, you are bound by its articles. If you violate one of the articles, then you'll get penalized. So, so here, when it comes to instructive discourse, we have instructive discourse with option and instructive discourse without option. Notice that these four types of discourse, as I have said, are not exclusive of each other. And the differences between them is a matter of focus. One can imagine the same topic approached from different angles, depending on the type of discourse you want to engage in. Assuming that you want to write a, a text about pollution or about abortion, then as an author you have, depending on where you are, what your job is, the context, you are in, this would indicate the type of discourse you would produce. For example, a journalist would produce an informative kind of text about, the, for example, the, okay, what pollution is doing to us here in Jordan or something like that. So, so an informative kind of <clears throat> the type, the types of pollution. Some information about how people can protect themselves from pollution and this kind of stuff. Another journalist might be more enthusiastic about this issue and write an argumentative, a commentary in which he attacks the government because it's not doing the right things when it comes to pollution. He wants to convince his leadership that the government is not doing what it's supposed to do regarding pollution. So he would tell people how serious pollution has become and what they're supposed to do. Maybe they're, they're okay, ask, asking them to do or to act in in different ways, ranging between uh, complaining and taking to the streets to demonstrate against the government ignoring the problem of pollution. Okay, and in this case, he would be writing a comment. So, so, so here, one can write a, a news report about pollution or about abortion or a commentary about abortion or pollution. And the difference between them would have to do with one being informative and the other being argumentative. A creative person, person by contrast, a, po a poet, for example, who's bothered by the problem of pollution in the city he lives in, might well might write a poem about pollution. Again, now the poem, the focus of the poem would be in, on his individual feelings toward this issue. And he would present the matter from a creative perspective rather than from an argumentative or an informative perspective. A fourth author, might write about might write a manual about abortion. What should a woman do? One, two, three, four, five, or a manual about pollution, measures of protecting yourself from pollution. The measures. Okay, so these such a text would be instructive. So arguably the same topic can be approached from these four different angles, depending on the author, who the author is. 
Okay, so much of this text typology. Let's move on to the third and the last text typology. In this lecture, or the last main text typology in this lecture, that is everyday language versus literary language. How is everyday language? How is it different from literary language? The key concept here is poeticness. How poetic the discourse, how poetic is the discourse. Not that poeticness is a matter of degree. So this means we have to put it on a scale ranging between minimally poetic and highly poetic. And here we have two poles. And if we are to locate two text genres there, two genres there, one would what? One would locate scientific discourse as minimally poetic and poetry as highly poetic. And in between, we have a spectrum of different genres that differ in their poeticness. So everyday, for example, everyday discourse is similar to literary discourse in some, respect, in some respects, but it's different in other respects. That's why literary discourse is more poetic than everyday discourse. Why? Because literary discourse invests more sources or more resources of poeticness. The key sources of poeticness are rhyme and meter, music. The more rhythmic and musical, the higher the degree of poeticness. Note that rhyme and meter are key attributes of poetry, verse. If we deprive verse of these two attributes, it's no longer verse, it becomes something else. It, we turn it into prose. So this is the key difference between prose and poetry. Poetry involves rhyme and meter. Prose does not employ these as its key features. That, that's why, okay, poetry exhibits the, high, the highest degree of poeticness in classical Arabic poetry, for example. If rhyme is removed, all right, we no longer have classical Arabic poetry. In modern Arabic poetry, all right, rhyme is done away with. But the music is still there. Okay, meter is still there. So it's all right. And some people, or many people, think that modern Arabic poetry cannot compare to classical Arabic poetry. Why? Because it does away with rhyme. And it's true that classical Arabic poetry is more musical than modern. Arabic poetry. Metaphor, the use of metaphorical language is an important attribute of literature, but it's also an important attribute of everyday language. But there in literature, we have creative metaphors. In everyday language, we have scores of such metaphorical expressions that are part of the language. So when it comes to metaphorical stuff, it's found in both everyday language as well as in 
literary language, but in literary language it is creative. Whereas in everyday language it is conventional. It's raining cats and dogs is more poetic than straining very heavily. My test was a piece of cake is more poetic than my test was very easy. A third or a fourth source of poeticness is parallelism. Parallelism, which is also an attribute of literature, but it can also be an attribute of non-literary discourse, for example, commentaries, which are meant to argue, to persuade, may involve lots of parallelism, attawazi. To be or not to be, that's the question. To be or not to be, all right, they are parallel. So parallelism is a source of poeticness. One more source of poeticness is intertextuality. Atanas. When you intertextualize, you make your discourse more poetic. Titling, for example. Ordinary titles versus creative titles. If, for example, you come across an article titled Ummat Iqra La Taqra, and another one titled Al Arab Hajar Al Qira, which one would be more attractive to you? Which title would be more attractive? Ummat Iqra La Taqra or Al Arab Hajar Al Qira? Of course, Ummat Iqra La Taqra. Why? Because it, inter it, it, it intertextualizes with the Holy Quran. And the reader would stop and say, oh, yeah, this is very interesting. I should read this article. But Al-Arab Hajar Al-Quran, this is a, okay, a straightforward kind of title, which is not that attractive compared to Al-Arab Hajar Al-Quran. Or in English, for example, America, Masterminds Middle East politics versus all the roads in Middle East, Middle East politics lead to the White House. Okay, that's that the remodeling here. All the roads in Middle East politics lead to the White House is more creative and more poetic than America masterminds Middle East politics. All the roads in Iran lead to, to Qom is more poetic than Al Malari Hum Sanna al Qarar fi Iran or the Mullahs are the decision makers in Iran compared to all the roads in Iran lead to Qom. Okay. We have two titles and they differ in their degree of poeticness. So the difference between literature and everyday language has to do with the degree of poeticness. And in fact, literature is there to defamiliarize things. And by defamiliarizing them, you make them more poetic. So, poeticness is not an all or nothing phenomenon, but rather it's a matter of degree. Jokes, for example, are very poetic. When you, when you crack a joke, you impress others and they start laughing. And that is because jokes are expressive, very expressive, and expressiveness 
heightens the degree of power thickness. One can even talk about simple things like the simple things we say and we okay can see that one mode is more poetic than another for example john and mary one can argue that john and mary is more poetic than mary and john how often do we say mary and john very unlikely I, I, all right this would be done only in an afterthought but not in a normal kind of situation okay if if you are referring to these two people then you say john and mary rather than mary and june but if in some context for example you say mary then you discover later on that you forgot june then this can be motivated the same applies to ladies and gentlemen how often do we say gentlemen and ladies not all right we don't do that why because john and mary and ladies and gentlemen sound more musical. In other words, they are more poetic than the other way around. That's why we do not violate this kind of tendency. And if we did, then there must be some reason for doing that. Okay, so far, as you can see, we have talked about three text typologies. We have talked about spoken verses, electronic, electronic verses, written discourse. We talked about informative versus argumentative versus expressive versus instructive discourse. And finally, we talked about every everyday language or everyday discourse versus literary discourse or everyday language versus literary language. And before I finish, all right, let me mention one more text typology which refers to spoken discourse. All right, so notice that most of most of the type or all the typologies we have mentioned relate to both written discourse and spoken discourse. But let me focus on spoken discourse and see that we have genres. We have different genres of spoken discourse. And one of the genres of, of spoken discourse is what's going on in this lecture, lecturing. Lecturing is a genre of spoken discourse. Not that it involves one speaker, in this case, myself, some audience, virtual audience, maybe. All right. Okay. Okay, so I'm at the end of the day I'll be well, putting this on YouTube and some people might might see it, might watch it. So all right, what about okay, we can describe spoken discourse based on some attributes some characteristics. For example, could I have come to this lecture without having done some preparation? I usually do minimal preparation. Okay, but it would be crazy to come to a lecture without having done some, pre some preparation. All right, so some highlights. At least you have to have some highlights in order, <coughs> in order to remind you of what to say what to discuss at least. And, okay, what about rank? Okay, I'm, all right. I have authority here, so in class, for example, when I'm lecturing, okay, 
we don't have equals here. We have unequal. We have the lecturer who has power and the students or the audience who lack power. So we have unequals rather than equals. When it comes to the topic, whether it has been predetermined or not, or prepared or not, okay, we assume that in lecturing it has been prepared. Number of speakers, one speaker. And the audience might involve the audience are many. The audience would have more than two. It's not one to one or even one to two, maybe, all right, but okay, we have one speaker, one speaker, but multiple listeners. What about the mode in terms of, is it informative, argumentative, or associative? Yeah, it could, basically this is supposed to, all right, in professional presentations, they're supposed to be argumentative. And, but when it comes to my lecture here, it's both argument, informative and argumentative at the same time. This can be contrasted with conversation, which is the most familiar genre in spoken discourse. Notice that the mode is associative. We have a number of speakers, a number of people coming together, and they take turns. So it is associative. What about the topic? Has it been predetermined? And the answer is no. Whatever comes up is talked about or is discussed. What about rank? Do we have equals or unequals? Here we have equals. Okay, so in a conversation, everyone is treated on an equal footing with others, right? So it's second conversation and rank involves equals rather than unequals. Debating is a third genre of spoken discourse. Al-Ittijah al for example. on Al Jazeera channel. What about the people debating? Are they equals or unequal? They are equals. Okay, we have a moderator and two other people, two experts. Do they come to the debate uh, unprepared? And the answer is no, all right. They're supposed to have done some preparation before they come to before they come live on TV. What mode is there? Is it informative or argumentative? It is argumentative. All right. They argue with each other. Sometimes they hit each other. They express different views and a lot of friction is generated. Interviewing is a fourth genre of spoken discourse. So in spoken discourse, we have different genres. So spoken discourse as a text type involves many genres, like lecturing, debating, interviewing, conversation, the most familiar type. And one last thing I should say about text types is the fact that discourse is becoming more and more multimodal. Multimodality of discourse has become the norm. This simply means that discourse might involve more than one modality, the spoken word, the visual, mode, for example, discourse on TV. Okay, 
the visual mode is as important as the spoken mode. And in lecturing, also you, okay, in a classroom, right, the instructor would use the written mode alongside the spoken mode. So it's the main mode is the spoken word, but there is a blackboard and the written mode is also there. The visual mode might be used, or so the, the instructor might show a video or show some pictures. What about magazines, newspapers? Okay. In a magazine, for example, the visual modality is in a fashion magazine. It's more important than the written modality. Do you buy a magazine to read or to look at models to see how see how pretty they are and what kind of clothes they wear, this kind of stuff. Okay, so this course in general has become multimodal. So multimodality is a very familiar kind of technique in this course nowadays. Audio, visual, spoken, written, Okay, all these might get involved in one discourse. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Thank you very much and goodbye.